Praveen Halapanavar's version of events surrounding the death of his wife Savita will be strenuously denied by the HSE, the hospital where she died and the doctor who treated her. We'll examine the evidence heard on the first day of the inquest into her death. We have been waiting for this and so the day has come so uh, I vote for Savita so I want to, all we want to get to the bottom of the truth. Also tonight, we look back on the life and times of Britain's first female Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. An extraordinarily divisive figure, her importance in 20th century history cannot be underestimated. We assess both her legacy here and in the UK. She didn't just lead our country, she saved our country. Hello and welcome to Primetime. First tonight, the inquest into the death of Savita Halapanavar got underway in Galway today. Her husband Praveen gave his testimony about what happened when his pregnant wife was admitted to Galway University Hospital last October. But both the hospital, the HSE and the doctor in charge of Savita's care say they will strenuously deny parts of his evidence. We'll later will assess the implications of that conflict. But first, Barry O'Kelly has this report on day one of the inquest into the death of Savita Halapanavar. It's almost six months since the death of Savita Halapanavar, and today her husband Praveen said there was now finally an opportunity to find out the truth. He told an inquest today that his wife was deeply upset when she made her first request for a termination at Galway University Hospital last October. Mr Halapanarver said his wife Savita found it difficult looking at her baby in the monitor after being told that the pregnancy was no longer viable. And he recalled how she had said, how can a mother wait for her baby to die? He said that minutes later, she made a second request for a termination to a consultant called Dr Catherine Asbury. Mr Halapanarver said his wife made a further request for a termination the following day. On that occasion, she contacted a midwife who called Dr Asbury and he claimed his wife was told, it's a Catholic thing and we won't be able to help you. However, Dr Asbury will deny ever saying this. The inquest heard that she will say she didn't mention anything about Catholicism. Dr Asbury will say there was only one discussion about a termination of pregnancy and that it was not warranted at this stage. Savita's husband said there were three requests for a termination. The inquest continues. Well, I'm joined now in studio by Derval MacDonald, who's Legal Affairs Editor with the Irish Independent. And Derval, we've already seen today that there will be disputed evidence. Now, can you explain to us how an inquest deals with a disputed evidence type situation? Well, in a very different way to proceedings that we're more familiar with. So, for example, in a criminal case, there's a prosecution and the defence. In a civil case, there is a plaintiff and a defendant. And although the standards of proof are different in both the criminal and civil case, they're both basically aimed at the same point, which is to assess liability or blame. An inquest is an inquisitorial process. It cannot, under law, make any findings in respect of civil or criminal liability. In theory, it's just there to test the medical evidence. So there are maybe two ways in which um, the, the conflict may be resolved or at least addressed in some way. It may be whether the coroner decides to sum up the evidence or otherwise give a charge to the jury in this case that are going to decide on the verdict. The other clue we may get is in um, the numerous um, verdicts that a jury in a coroner's inquest can give. And some of them we can already rule out. We can probably rule out um, suicide or um, an unlawful killing, which are some of the, um, uh, some of the verdicts that a jury can give. They can also give misadventure, they can give an open verdict, they can say it's natural causes, they can say it's medical misadventure. So there's a whole range, but critically, you can't assign any civil or criminal liability. But even within that, the Supreme Court has recognised in at least two cases that th these aren't clinical things. A pathologist report, even though it's a scientific uh, thing, can in another form, let's say in a civil or criminal case, point to either was this an accident or a crime. So people will be looking very, very closely at the narrative, at the medical verdicts, and it would be very interesting because to date we've only had one version 
of events. We knew the thrust of uh, Pravin Halapanovar's evidence. Today we heard an awful lot more. But what we're going to see in the following days, which the key battlegrounds, I think, are going to be, was that statement, this is a Catholic country, was it ever uttered? Um, it's going to be denied and also, that that was. Darbell, in what context was it uttered? Now, we know it's going to be denied, but you can look at it in a number of different ways because it could be used in an apologetic way or it could be used in, a, in an explaining way or it could be used in quite an aggressive way. So all of these things need to be teased out over the next few days. And they do. And, and you have to remember that it was this reported comment that really convulsed um, people in Ireland and elsewhere and made this um, a big international story. The other issue, I think, there are two separate but related issues. One is the management of the sepsis or the infection, which in one case might be a strictly medical issue. The second is what happened when there was a request for a termination. A key issue is uh, uh, her husband said, there were three requests. The hospital says there was just one. But what happened? We know that the hospital and the doctor are going to say that there was no threat to her life at that stage. But I think that those separate but related issues which have become conflated in the public's mind are going to be key to the outcome of this verdict. Critically, um, a jury um, in a, a case like this, they can um, issue what's known as a rider or a recommendation. And perhaps at the end suggesting uh, something that might inform uh, best medical practice. And that might be one of the most interesting features of this case. If they do that, how will it feed into the public policy which is being decided at a political level so in terms could, of... That, that, that could inform the drafting of, of legislation which is happening now, if it hasn't happened already. I mean, the, the verdict in, in this in, uh, inquest you're saying could perhaps well, have an influence on it, what legislation It has in other contexts. In other contexts where a jury has given a rider and made recommendations, they have found themselves into best practice. The government can choose to, to accept or to ignore those recommendations. But I think this is it's, it's a very, very interesting inquest. Like some that have gone before it, ostensibly it's there just to establish the medical facts of a case. But families and indeed the public in a lot of these cases are searching for something more. And it, would you say that in many cases families find inquests when it comes to the verdict stage a deeply unsatisfactory process? It, it can fall two ways. They can find it deeply unsatisfactory because it's, it's very constrained. It can't assess civil or criminal liability. On the other hand, families um, are increasingly finding uh, that they can secure a verdict in a coroner's court that they may not be able to establish elsewhere, i.e. in a civil or criminal um, case. But this is one that's going to be closely followed. We're going to see a very, very different version of events. How will the facts ultimately resolve? It could be resolved at the coroner's level or it could be resolved in other forward at a later stage. So the medical interpretation that we're going to see over the next few days when the staff who are involved in Savita's care give evidence. That's going to be quite crucial, isn't it? It is, and, and, and that is what we've been missing so far. We've been missing that side of the story, that understanding. But you ask any doctor involved in these cases, you know, the key question is, what constitutes a risk to a woman's life? You know, does it have to be a pressing emergency at that time? Is it something over a period of days, weeks or months? And I think that we'll gain a really insight into the understanding. But I, from what we know already, I think that the hospital, indeed the doctor, are happy that in terms of the legal position, there was no threat to the life or to the health of, of Savita Halapanovar when they denied the request for the termination. A couple of more issues that... that um became evident today, Praveen conceded that he might have been mixed up in, in terms of the dates of when things were said to him because of the pressure he was under at the time. Does that have any relevance on the story, do you think, or, or on his reliability as, as a witness? Well, you know, it, this isn't a criminal civil forum, but I suppose ultimately issues as to credibility and um, recall of memory do become critical. And in uh, circumstances we're trying to establish on a day by day, hour by hour, and even on a minute by minute basis, especially what happens when from a medical perspective. Especially when somebody was under the type of strain that you can imagine he was under at that particular Indeed, moment Indeed, at that time, time. And, and that is going to be compared and contrasted with the medical notes that were kept or otherwise not kept um, during that time. So I think we're still in the very, very early stages of this, but over the next few days we are going to see perhaps a different hue uh, put onto this story and perhaps it might be very, very different to what we first imagined. So just to be clear, this inquest verdict can be taken and used in another court? No, it cannot be used in another court. But can, it, can it inform another court? Well, I think what the Supreme Court have said is that um, facts by themselves are not neutral and um, they said that they can be pregnant with implications so that in one context in the coroner's context you can't assign civil or criminal liability but the same facts tested in another forum might be relevant to civil or criminal liability. It, it's actually quite similar to um, the, like a tribunal of inquiry. Um, what you say in that can't be used against you in another forum but it may form a roadmap or a pathway if there are future inquiries okay. um, or indeed if the, the family of Savita Halapanovar decide to sue any of the parties involved. Darvel, thank you very much for joining us. Miriam.
Well, she was the grocer's daughter from Grantham, the grammar school girl born without a silver spoon in her mouth, who became Britain's first female prime minister and spawned a political ideology all of her own Thatcherism. Margaret Thatcher, who died earlier today, transformed the social and economic fabric of British society. But in so doing, the Iron Lady became a hugely divisive figure both here and in the UK, and those divisions remained so in her death. In a moment, we'll be assessing the legacy of Margaret Thatcher with a broad group of politicians and analysts. First though this from Ethna O'Brien. The tough measures that this government has had to introduce are the very minimum needed for us to win through. I will not change just to court popularity. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Margaret Thatcher was one of the most iconic politicians of modern times. Deeply divisive, she was either loved or loathed but few doubted the clarity of our vision for British society. The ladies not for turning. In a succession of firsts, she became the first woman to lead a major political party when she successfully challenged Tory leader Ted Heath in 1975. But an event that happened only weeks before the general election of 1979 was to help shape her view of the Northern Troubles for the rest of her career, when her close friend and mentor, the Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Erin Neve, was killed by an INLA bomb as he left the Palace of Westminster. Her Majesty the Queen has asked me to form a new administration. As Prime Minister, she was the scourge of the trade union movement in the wake of the winter of discontent in 1979. Her vision of Britain's economy was one ruled not by trade unions, but by markets. What we've got. The battle that defined her in Britain was that against the miners. She prevailed, but many communities have never recovered in Britain's old industrial heartland. The troubles in the North always loomed over administration. She saw the hunger strikers as a challenge to the legitimate government of Britain and as such no concession could be granted to them. The conditions apply to all prisoners in Northern Ireland the same. Murder, maiming, bombing, violence are crimes. As unemployment rose in 1981, her approval rating fell to 25%. But a relatively popular war changed all that when she retook the Falkland Islands from invading Argentinian forces. In May 1984, the New Ireland Forum, established by Gareth Fitzgerald, issued a report listing three alternative structures for administering Northern Ireland. At a press conference, Thatcher dismissed all of them, one by one. The unified Ireland uh, uh, was one solution that is out. Um, a second solution was a confederation of two states, that is out. A third solution was joint authority, that is out. In 1984, the IRA's campaign came once again to her very door, when a bomb at the Conservative Party conference in Brighton left five people dead and many others injured. Mrs Thatcher survived, and so did her determination to crush the terrorists. It was an attempt not only to disrupt and terminate our conference, it was an attempt to cripple Her Majesty's democratically elected government. Despite this event, she signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement the following year, enshrining the right of the Irish Republic to a role in the affairs of Northern Ireland. But many felt she didn't understand Ireland, alienating moderate nationalists while simultaneously angering the unionist community. Margaret Thatcher won an unprecedented third term in 1987 and faced into the worst street violence in living memory with her introduction of the poll tax. She survived a leadership challenge in 1989, but the men in grey suits were coming and key figures in her cabinet went to tell her that her time was up after a difficult EU summit in Rome. In Britain, Margaret Thatcher has divided public opinion, but has earned their respect. She took on the unions, but made it possible for many to buy their own homes. She remained deeply sceptical about attempts to deepen EU integration and the Euro. 
She alienated both sides in the North, but some might suggest that in facing down the IRA, she might have laid the foundation for the idea that no total military victory was possible for either side. Ethno Brian reporting there. First of all, Matthew Paris, broadcaster, former Tory MP. You worked for Mrs. Thatcher for, I think, two years as her correspondent secretary. On a personal level, what was she like, Matthew? Well, to, to work for her as a boss, she was the most fantastic boss that anybody could ever want. She never took it out on subordinates. She was always beautifully polite and kind to us. She remembered that my father had been ill and asked how he was. She was always in the office before we got in in the morning and she, she had never gone home by the time we left for home. So to work for her uh, was wonderful, but apparently to work with her, to be one of her equals, was a very different matter indeed. She could be absolutely beastly to her colleagues. In terms of her legacy, I know you yourself are interested in the historian Tom Carlyle and he spoke about the history of the world as but the biography of great men. In other words, that strong individuals do change the course of our history. In the case of Margaret Thatcher taking over in 75, was it a case of, you know, cometh the woman, cometh the hour, cometh the woman in her case? No, I, I, I think not. Uh, you know, it, it's very easy to conclude that history just sweeps politicians along in their path and really they're helpless in the face of economic and social and cultural forces. And, uh, it, you know, that's a Marxist point of view that I think is often, often the case. But in Margaret Thatcher's case, she just arrived in 1979. The whole Conservative Party was taken by storm, so to speak, by her. They, they were not convinced by her in the first instance. The, the, the feeling in the Conservative Party in those days that was Britain was that uh, we were ungovernable as a, a nation. The trade unions had uh, taken over. Too many people depended on the state. There was no way that a free market party could ever win an election again. And we really just had to manage the decline of the United Kingdom. She came in to all that, that like, like, like a gale, in a sense, saying that it was not true. It needn't be the case. Uh, the, the, the Britain could be, so to speak, won back uh, for the Conservative cause and people were pretty unconvinced at the start and slowly she won them over. I don't think that any other leader of the Conservative Party, Willie Whitelaw or any of the other available leaders, all sort of public school, Oxbridge, middle of the road men, I don't think any of them would have really taken, grip, taken history by the throat, sort of gripped the nation by its lapels in the way that she did. Did she have to be as divisive as she was? And obviously, she had a radical programme. She sought to transform the social and economic framework of Britain. But along the way, she was incredibly divisive. Do you think she had to be that divisive to achieve what she set out to achieve? I'm afraid I come to the conclusion that I do think that. I, I must say, working for her and then later as one of her members of parliament, I found her unkindness uh, sometimes towards mm. those parts of Britain that you really couldn't expect to like what she was doing. Uh, I, f I, I found that strange. I, I found uh, the way she divided Britain into those who were with us and those who were against us, those who were our people, as she put it, and those who were not our people, a, a, a sense sometimes of callousness towards whole communities, mm. coal mining, coal and steel, the shipbuilding industry, whole communities that were devastated. Uh, by, by conservative policies, I, I found that hard sometimes to stomach. But looking back on it, I don't think there was any other way she could have made the changes in Britain uh, other, other than the, the, in the way that she did. Uh, you know, she had to end the subsidies to mining. She had to end the subsidies to uh, unprofitable industries. And people, people were the victims of it, and you couldn't expect them to like her for it. Final question, when you see David Cameron today talking about not only did she lead the country, she saved the country, where do you think her legacy falls? I think it was in breaking the trade union movement, breaking the back of the trade union movement, that I, as a Conservative, would say that she did save the country. You've got to be able to remember what Britain was like in the 1970s with strikes all over the place and the feeling that the government was no longer in, to con in control. You've got to remember that, I think, to understand the difference that she made. OK, listen, Matthew, really appreciate you joining us tonight because I know you're rushing off now to do New Zealand television, so thanks for joining us. Jerry Kelly in Belfast. Look, I mean, 
Is there anything that has dimmed the strong feelings of, I possibly could call it hatred, that Republicans feel for Mrs Thatcher? Has anything in the decades since the hunger strikes dulled that anger and pain? Well, I think you have to be try, try to be uh, objective about this thing, especially over a period of time. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, I think, was a very militaristic uh, person. She was a very militaristic leader. She was a warmonger. Uh, she was not involved in conflict resolution. She was involved entirely in trying to crush, whether that was in terms of what happened in Ireland and what happened with Republicans or whether it was with the, uh, the Argentinians and the Malvinas and Falklands. That, that was her, her way of doing it. I've heard some people today saying that she sat... Uh, if you like the platform for peace, but I, I, I see no evidence whatsoever that there ever would have been a conflict resolution process, a peace process, and indeed uh, um, the Good Friday Agreement if she had have maintained uh, power. But with the wisdom, I suppose, of hindsight and the decades that have gone, Jerry, what about, I suppose, in March 1979, I think it was Airy Neve was murdered. So that anyone who writes about her has said was a hugely formative moment in her life. So perhaps by, it came, by the time it came to 1981 and the hunger strikes, she came with a certain position, as well as believing in the rule of law and that the will of the government must always reign. But can you even understand where she was coming from? But surely, you know, she was a Prime Minister and, and she lost friends. Uh, I lost relatives uh, in the conflict. I lost uh, quite a number of, of close friends, actually. Uh, there are other families there who did not have the power to make a change, who did not have the power to be involved in, in, in a, a resolution process and who simply suffered uh, from the conflict. Now, she was part of that conflict. There was a duty on her, as indeed you could argue there was a duty uh, on Sinn Féin and indeed on the IRA and other organisations to uh, come to a resolution, a, a conflict resolution process. But she had no wish or, or uh, um, drive to go in that direction. She falsely believed uh, that she did not have to deal with the, the issues around conflict, with the causes of conflict, and thought that she could uh, uh, simply defeat um, the IRA, which of course uh, her generals had already um, come to the conclusion and yet and yes, Jerry. When you look at it, I suppose at the end of the day, no one won. I mean, there was a realization when you talk to Republicans around the mid 80s, they would say they came to the realization it was an unwinnable war. So maybe her obstinacy, her ruthlessness, maybe her harshness did maybe ultimately bring Republicans to a view that this war cannot be won. And maybe the, uh, may maybe the military actions of the IRA brought the British to uh, discover that also and, and yeah. we ended up at a negotiating table. But really, is that the issue? Because the question here is, if we're talking about legacy, uh, could she have made a decision earlier, as Republicans were trying to do, uh, to come to negotiations and to try and uh, um, work our way um, through the issues which had caused the conflict? And the conflict did not come from outer space. There were reasons for that conflict. Now, I think that's the difficulty with uh, trying to analyse okay. this and nearly a personal view of what Thatcher was or anybody else. Ronan Panning, in terms of her legacy here in Ireland? Well, I'd just like to pick up on a couple of points Jerry Kelly's been made. He hasn't mentioned the Unionists. And without Margaret Thatcher, the Unionists would never have been Unionist domination. Northern Ireland would never have been broken because that is what she did and that's what the Anglo-Irish agreement did. Jerry Kelly is also very conveniently forgetting that the Anglo-Irish agreement to give Sinn Féin their due, Sinn Féin saw the strategic opportunities in the Anglo-Irish agreement. They realised they couldn't win the war and but they also realised that there was a possibility after the Anglo-Irish agreement that the British were serious about not allowing the Unionists to run Northern Ireland on their own. Because one always has to remember about Margaret Thatcher that she resented very bitterly what happened after the Sunningdale Agreement when the Unionists brought down the Sunningdale Agreement. Now the Anglo-Irish agreement was an agreement that could not be brought down and the Unionists realised it could not be brought down. The Anglo-Irish Agreement could be dismantled, but it could only be dismantled by the people she regretted, who erected it. She regretted it afterwards, she says, because she, she felt did. the security didn't come back. 
conversation? Well, she said later on, she was once asked by a very unionist colleague just after she retired, why did you sign the agreement? And this is something we haven't heard in any of the commentary today. And she said, I signed the agreement because the Americans asked me to sign the agreement. Yeah, no, Jerry Collins, um, as Minister for Justice and Minister for Foreign Affairs, you both met her and had dealings with her. Why do you think she reviewed, viewed us as a nation back then in the early stages of the peace process before it even began? Uh, I, I think, firstly, I, I feel I should say to you, Miriam, that Mrs. Thatcher was an exceptionally complex person. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher was a very, very intelligent person a woman of great conviction, sound conviction. And I feel that when she came into office in the late 70s, uh, at that time, if you can recall, uh, acts of terrorism were happening, you know, every hour of every day on a continuous basis, and people were being killed and murdered. And Mrs. Thatcher believed then, in my view, is that she, she believed that the only answer to all this mayhem in Northern Ireland was that a military one, a security, a, a security answer, and, and she went down that line. I, I presume her security forces were giving her that line. And she went down that line uh, blindfoldedly, if you like, hoping that at the end of the day, uh, this would ease away the problem. But of course, that was a big mistake from day one. Uh, and I think she, it took her some time to realize that this was a mistake. It took constant uh, efforts on the sides of uh, the government of Ireland and the different periods leading up to the uh, Anglo-Irish agreement to try and get her to understand that there that, that also had to be a political answer. There also had to be uh, an answer that would be acceptable to both sides. As Ronan said a while ago, there were two sides, two extremes there, two different traditions that had to be try and get them to compromise and come together. It took her a long course, time to understand respect, that. With respect, okay. it was Margaret Thatcher was one of the extremes. Uh, you know, you can't say that she reacted to what the IRA was doing. Margaret Thatcher took a militaristic um, approach, not only to uh, the Irish issue, but also to the Argentinian issue. So she you was involved he, in the shoot-to-kill be... policy, and she, was, and she yeah. was involved in killing people as well, Jerry. Well, 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 Jerry one of the, the great Republican complaints about Margaret Thatcher is the hunger strikes. Now, in, I, I'm not saying Margaret Thatcher planned this, but it was because of Margaret Thatcher's hard line on the hunger strikes. And because of the way that polar, the, the, this is one of the ironies of history, because of the way it polarized opinion, that won support for Sinn Féin, and that got Sinn Féin into the political process, and they decided that perhaps they wouldn't abstain from the legislative assemblies. But it's now, almost she like didn't. What, that wasn't that wasn't necessarily by design. But it's obviously what Matthew Paris always says. Like you wondered, did she have to be that cruel? I mean, I'm conscious there are families watching tonight of, you know, some of those hunger strikers. She was very extreme on the miners. You wondered, did she have to go well, I'll tell that you a story full way? I'll tell you a story about, about the hunger strikers died. during the hunger strike, which was obviously a very emotional time. And I was teaching at UCD, and there were m marches from Belfield. Uh, into town and, and it was a very, very emotional time. And I had a documents class, British Irish Relations, which is what I teach, and I handed round this document and I said, now, what do you make of that? And they sort of, and they went on for about 20 minutes complaining and using very strong language indeed about Margaret Thatcher and what an impossible woman she was on the hunger strikes. The document wasn't written by Margaret Thatcher, it was written by Eamon de Valera, and nothing Margaret Thatcher said about not giving in to hunger strikes was any stronger than what Eamon de Valera said. Well, well with, with, respect on that, with respect on that point, I mean, saying that de Valera was as bad as Margaret Thatcher really doesn't deal with the issue. Come on, Jerry. You know, come the on, fact Jerry, was, on, the, the on, fact is real. that get she real. had, she Who had, runs well, the I state? am real. And, and incidentally, I'm an ex-hunger striker as well. Now, the fact is, that she could have resolved the issues in jail. And, and, and if you want to look at history, and you are a historian, then you will realise that yeah. after uh, Reneagan, after well, Reneagan stories, on something in 1980, and, and the then in 1981, and also, and I lived through it also, and I lived through it also, I lived through it also, and some people did not. I lived through it also, I lived through it also, and the five demands were eventually got in 1983, not because of uh, what Thatcher was doing, but because th there was then a mass escape. 
Okay. So what they refused to give and what they could have given 1981, they gave in 1983 anyway. A legacy, in terms of her legacy, both because of your own interest in British politics, but both in terms of her role in the United Kingdom and here. How would you see it? I think her legacy is that she, is, she will certainly be remembered as one of the great prime ministers because she unquestionably changed Great Britain. And if you look at the people whom she took on and whom she defeated, Galtieri in Argentina, Arthur Scargill, Derek Hatkin, the Trotskyite in Liverpool, Sinn Féin and the IRA. Well, some of us, including myself, are quite happy that they didn't win. Jerry Collins, what about the her legacy? What Jerry about Collins? The I, I, believe, I, I, I believe that, that uh, without her help and her support uh, and bringing us to the situation where we got her to sign the Anglo-Irish Agreement, that we would still have many, many difficulties to resolve in the country. We still have some, of course, but she was necessary at that. It took some convincing, it took some effort, but thankfully she, she was open to be convinced, and I believe she was eventually. Very Regrettably, last. it took a long time. OK, thanks, Jerry. Last word to you, Jerry Kelly. Well, I think you have to look at when she has been praised for these things, that at the other end of all these, whether it was the poll tax manners, the hunger strikers, uh, or indeed the Argentinians, that there were people who died and they died at her hands because of her decisions. And we should not ignore that either because people will not ignore that about Republicans. Okay. Jerry Kelly, Jerry Collins, Rona Fanning and Matthew Paris earlier. Thank you all very much for coming in tonight. Claire. He's a world famous academic in the field of linguistics, but he's probably better known as a political dissident and longtime critic of US foreign policy. Professor Noam Chomsky has spent a lifetime highlighting injustices around the world. Well, last week he was in Ireland, where Prime Time's Robert Short caught up with him. Great powers uh, do not support human rights, except sporadically. Uh, they don't support democracy. Noam Chomsky has been an outspoken voice on human rights and foreign policy for decades. He was in Ireland last week for a series of lectures. He also recorded an interview with Primetime. I asked him first about the ongoing war in Syria. Syria is a pretty awful situation. In fact, the two sides are moving towards a, a kind of a suicidal conflict. The only plausible way out is uh, through some form of negotiations. Uh, neither side is capable of destroying the other, that's pretty clear. And pl certainly plenty of atrocities on both sides, mostly government, but it's uh, not alone. There's a big debate in Europe over whether or not uh, the Syrian opposition should be armed and whether or not a, an EU embargo on uh, arms to Syria should be lifted. Uh, what's your view on that? First of all, the opposition is being armed. Pouring arms into the area is likely to inflame conflicts, atrocities, uh, probably end up uh, helping the... I mean, when you arm a group, the arms tend to go to the best fighters, the ones who are on the front. And those happen to be uh, uh, the jihadi elements. There's problems with what's called the Middle East peace process is a process organized and run by the United States. And there can't be a serious peace process that way. The U.S. is an advocate, not a neutral observer. If there were to be a genuine peace process, it would be administered by some country that, for one thing, has a degree of international respect. Do you think that there's, there has been any change at all in the approach of the United States towards uh, Israel and uh, the Palestinian territories under President Obama? Because he was actually criticised for his approach towards uh, Israel at one point over the last uh, couple of years. Actually, under him it's gotten worse, which was totally predictable. In fact, I wrote about it in 2008 before he was even before the primaries even, just using his web page. It was pretty clear that I can give you the details if you like, but it was pretty clear that he was not going to be willing to support anything that involved Palestinian rights. And apart from some 
what's called soaring rhetoric. That's the term that's usually described for him. Apart from the soaring rhetoric, there's been nothing except making it worse. In the case of Iran, uh, no one knows, including U.S. intelligence, whether they're trying to develop nuclear weapons. Maybe they are. A uh, general assumption is they're probably trying to develop what's called nuclear capability. That means the ability to develop a nuclear weapon if you choose to, and dozens of countries have that. Uh, the, uh, uh, so are there concrete measures you could take to avoid that, short of sanctions and war? Yeah, there are. Uh, so one possibility, for example, would be to try to renew an agreement that was reached in May 2010 uh, between Brazil, Turkey, and Iran. Uh, they agreed uh, uh, that uh, Iran would stop uranium enrichment. Uh, it would send its low enriched uranium for storage elsewhere, in fact, at Turkey. And in return, the West would provide uh, isotopes, what, whatever's needed for the medical reactors in Iran. That was the agreement. As soon as that agreement was reached, it was bitterly condemned by the United States. It's Obama. Uh, the U.S. media denounced uh, Brazil particularly for carrying this out. Uh, uh, the head of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Mohamed al uh, said that the U.S. is refusing to take yes for an answer. The U.S. is supporting uh, warlords who are not all that different from the Taliban. And the question is, what are the effects of their staying there? Uh, what the effects of their staying there will probably be to prolong the conflict. Uh, is, isn't it Afghanistan, I suppose, a prime example of the difficulties of intervention? No, because there were no difficulties. The U.S. invaded Afghanistan. We know why. It was public. No secret documents needed. In early October 2011, uh, 20, 2001, uh, George Bush announced that uh, it, he, he demanded that the Taliban hand over uh, Osama bin Laden to the United States uh, for prosecution. Uh, the Taliban requested evidence. Uh, the U.S. refused to provide any evidence. Well, that was the invasion. Nothing about the uh, moral concerns. Uh, but should there be? I mean, is, is Afghanistan an example of the, the, the rest of the world has a responsibility towards, towards a people where there is no... There is no state, or at least there, w there was well, no the state there when the Taliban was there. I mean, what you're saying would be true if governments of the world accepted that they have a responsibility for anything except the, their own power and uh, the powerful the, uh, demands of the powerful sectors within them. Prime Time is Robert Short there talking to Noam Chomsky. Well, that's it for tonight. The next news on RT News Now after this programme. And News 2 is going to be at 5 past 11 tonight. Pat and I will be back tomorrow night with a live studio audience. If you want to be in that audience tomorrow on any Tuesday night, just email us at primetimeaudience at rt.ie or you can telephone us at Dublin number 2082941. For now, though, from Claire and myself, everyone on Prime Time, thank you very much for watching and ihewa. This week, the former governor of Mount Joy urges a group of teenagers to get down to the serious business of clowning around. They're building their skills and their self-esteem in John Lonergan's Circus, a new series beginning on Thursday at a quarter past ten here on RTE1. Next tonight, as part of the Island of the Movie season, we go back to the earliest days of cinema and the pictures of Ireland that were painted on the silver screen. Theo Calum's in Ireland, next.